Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Albone, the CEO of TM Group, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all to the latest TM TV broadcast. For those of you who are new to TM TV, we've been hosted in this series since early April and have covered a wide range of property related subjects. Please visit us on LinkedIn and you'll see uh, the past episodes and be able to register for upcoming topics. Today's session is our biggest so far with a very distinguished panel who are going to debate cybercrime and its impact on the property market. TM has been established for over 20 years with its mission to streamline the property transaction for the benefit of all. We provide technology-led solutions to property professionals, specifically looking at the due diligence of a property transaction, and have also recently launched our new MEO proposition, Move It On, which is targeted at estate agents and home movers, with its aim to build digital chains, automate sales progression, and provide everyone with up-to-date information on their transaction. From that brief introduction of what TM is all about, I hope you can see why we are also interested in the impact that cybercrime can have on the property market. If during today's session you would like to ask a question of the panel, then please do use the messaging facility, which is available uh, from your meeting toolbar, and we'll try and get an answer to you if time permits. So now it gives me great pleasure to welcome our host today, Angela Edwards, co-founder and director of Circle to Success Limited, a business support organization operating across the Southwest and Midlands with a newly launched UK digital service. Angela is also a trustee on the Cyber Trust, a charity working with vulnerable people and hosted the 2019 inaugural National Cyber Awards. Angela, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed um, this morning for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that, that warm, wel warm welcome. Um, for what is a really important conversation, um, you know, this is something that impacts on all of us. At some point in our lives, you know, we're all buying property or selling property. So it's a really, really important conversation for us all. Um, and I don't know if any of you noticed this week, but on the news, on the BBC News at the weekend, it was reported by CIFAS, which is the counter-fraud organisation, that the increase in identity fraud has gone up 18%. So that's now over 223,000 cases of ID theft last year. So you can see this is a real issue. Um, so it's a hot topic and something that is only going to get worse with the COVID-19, people working remotely, being more vulnerable, and perhaps not having those normal touch points that they might have to ask the IT department or ask a colleague. Um, we're all more isolated and more vulnerable. So this is a fantastic conversation to have, and I am absolutely delighted to have such a fabulous panel here with us today. So I would now like to move on and introduce you to that panel. And I'd like to start with the Right Honourable Lord Blunkett. So David Blunkett was awarded a peerage in the Dissolution Honours List in 2015, taking the title of Lord Blunkett of Brightside and Hillsborough in the city of Sheffield. David was a Member of Parliament for Sheffield, Brightside and Hillsborough from 1987 to 2015 and a member of Tony Blair's uh, cabinet for eight years from 1997. He served as Education and Employment Secretary, Home Secretary, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, and is currently Professor of Politics in Practice at the University of Sheffield, Chair of the Board of University of Law, Chair of the Heathrow Implementation Steering Group, and involved in many charity and organisations across the UK and locally and also an avid supporter of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. A very warm welcome to you, David. Thank you very much. Andrew. I'd like to now go and introduce Mr. Neil Walsh. Neil joined the United Nations in January 2015 and is chief of the Cybercrime and Anti-Money Laundering Section. With staff in six continents, Neil leads the UN Office and Drugs on Crime of Strategic Response to cybercrime, money laundering, terrorist financing, and counter proliferation. Neil and his team advise the UN's senior leadership, including Secretary General, General Assembly, and the Security Council. And prior to joining the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, Neil served for over 15 years in the UK National Crime Agency, countering international serious organized crime and terrorism. 
And Neil's broad work experience includes head of government policy making and extensive covert operations countering cybercrime, terrorism, money laundering, online child sexual exploitation, drug trafficking, human trafficking, and weapons proliferation. Warm welcome to you, Neil. Thank you for joining us. Next, I'd like to introduce Nicola Whiting, MBE. Nicola Whiting is Chief Strategy Officer and co-owner of Titania Group. She is also an Amazon best-selling author and is listed in SC Magazine's Top 20 Most Influential Women Working in Cybersecurity. In 2019, Nicola was honored to receive the Sparky Baird Award for her work in AI and awarded the National Cyber Citizen of the Year Award for her outstanding contribution to the world of cybersecurity and protection. And in 2020, she was awarded an MBE for services to international trade and diversity. A very warm welcome to you also, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, I'd like to now move over to Nick Parfit. Nick is head of market planning for Accurate Risk Intelligence and has for a majority of his 22 years career focused on financial crime compliance and in the fields of anti-money laundering, fraud and cyber security. Having held senior compliance positions in top tier management consulting firms and financial institutions. Nick has been centered around global policy making, operating models, technology and analytics to help regulated firms meet and future proof their compliance functions. And finally, I would like to introduce Joe Pepper. Joe is the Chief Executive Officer of TM Group, a business which specializes in providing secure data and information services to key professionals operating across the UK property market, most notably law firms and estate agents. Having also worked closely with the lending and surveying community in recent years, Joe is a long-term advocate of securely digitizing the property transaction process and bringing all parties into a secure online space to both shorten the time taken and remove the existing points of weakness. So we have a fantastic panel today and a warm welcome to you all. So, this morning, we are gonna look at some questions around this key topic, which I think we all understand the importance of this, with house prices being probably the, the most expensive product and, and purchase that we'll ever make. Um, it makes it incredibly lucr lucrative for these cyber criminals to tap into this particular um, exercise and to try and make the most out of this. So I'd like to start by um, coming to um, Lord Bunkett. So if I can ask you, David, what you feel is the biggest threat faced today by businesses and citizens in the UK from the increase in the cyber crime that we're seeing? Thanks very much, Angela. Well, clearly for today's purposes, we're not talking about state-sponsored attacks like the ones that uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, was talking about. Uh, uh, in early June, we're probably not talking about um, youngsters who are geeks sitting in their attic um, getting into the uh, computer of the Pentagon. We're, we're talking about people who, eat, although in that case, actually, it might be an ex-employee who'd like to disrupt and dislocate your business. So actually, you need to look out for that as well. I'll never forget when I was Home Secretary, learning the hard way about um, internet uh, crime and cyber attack when I was negotiating with Nicolas Sarkozy, who was then the interior minister in France. And we were negotiating closing the Sangat camp in northern France, where several thousand refugees had collected. Uh, to cut a long story short, I discovered that he knew what my bottom line was. Um, and therefore, the negotiations were somewhat curtailed because he knew how many refugees I was prepared to take. And he, and he also knew what I wanted out of him. So it was, it, we did a deal in the end, but it was a bit one-sided. And that has some relevance to the property market, because if people know uh, what's going on behind the scenes and also what their competitors are up to, uh, then they obviously put some people at a great disadvantage. But you've touched already on identity fraud, and that is obviously a multiplicity of issues, uh, not just in terms of 
fraud and I imagine Neil and Joe will talk more about this in terms of money laundering and the uh, issues around that and uh, theft of uh, financial details but also in terms of what people are actually up to. I noticed that one of the airlines had a, a, a big attack a few weeks ago which uh, resulted in them losing nine million details of people's proposed flights. This was obviously details before the lockdown of people's proposed flight details. Now, obviously that's been completely disrupted by events. Had it not been, then it wouldn't have been the credit cards that you could cancel. It would be the empty homes as people were on holiday because they could map the times that people were away. And I use that as an example because you, when you went into the estate agent for either domestic or um, commercial property in the past, it's quite unlikely that all your details would have been up on the wall, all the times when you were available, all the times when the place was likely to be empty. Well, you get all those details now online. People can uh, obviously intrude on those. Um, they can decide how they're going to use them. And this is not just uh, in terms of hacking into computers. This is the way in which people can use the supply chain, people putting in um, equipment or heating or ventilation uh, in properties, which then actually gives them further access. So there's a whole range of issues here that might start with identity theft and end up with a plethora of dangers, which can be dealt with. And I just want to finish by saying, People shouldn't be scared about this. They should think about cyber attack in the way that they would think about their own uh, commercial property or their home. If you leave the windows open, if you leave the doors open, uh, if you advertise when you're not going to be there, uh, if you're careless about where you leave your keys in the hall for your car, someone's able quite easily to get them and steal your vehicle. The same thing applies online, but in a much more sophisticated fashion uh, and with much greater speed and devastation. So that's the, the opening gambit. Um, we've, we've got a responsibility ourselves. We've got to train our staff. We've got to make sure that they're skilled and knowledgeable, but we've not to frighten them to death. Yeah, and I would I would wholeheartedly agree with that, David. And you know that is exactly uh, what they were talking about on the news this weekend. And they used an example of this young lady called Gemma 30 years old, um, and she had absolutely no idea. She was applying for a mortgage, she'd been saving up, it was the dream of a lifetime, and only when she applied for that mortgage, it was refused. So then when they looked into it, somebody had stolen her identity. She had absolutely no idea. And worse than that, trying to unpick that, she has a cost of 10,000 pounds to herself now, um, which, you know, this crime is a faceless crime. So, so who is liable for that? And I, think she, it took, I think it took two years before she could get her identity sorted out uh, as well. Um, absolutely. Yeah, cl clearly those who were responsible for poor systems and processes uh, and training and therefore policies within the, the companies are responsible. Pinning that down is another matter entirely. But that's why vigilance is clear. We, we're not going to go into um, identity registers and ID protection this morning, but I've been very keen on that over a very large number of years, not to intrude into people's private lives, but actually to try and se secure their well-being by they alone having control of their identity. And I think in future we'll be able to do that. But here's a thought. We're, we're online. People are talking about being online, being able to do a lot more from home. Your, your, your equipment at home is less likely to be secure than equipment in the office because in the office people are taking the measures, they're getting the skilled personnel in, perhaps an information officer to do that. They're aware of the danger of, of data protection uh, legislation uh, hitting them and therefore the information commissioner coming down like a ton of bricks. At home people think, oh well it's my computer, it's my iPhone, it's whatever. Uh, of course, you know, doing it yourself doesn't make you any less vulnerable no. than the equipment at work. 
I, I absolutely agree. And I think there's been a, you know, a, a, a big conversation about remote working and how safe that is and, you know, and people's behaviours. So thank you. Thank you, David, for that. Um, I'd like to come across to you, Neil, um, and I'd like to ask, you know, if you agree with what uh, David has been saying, but also, you know, what are you seeing from a global perspective at the UN? Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody from Vienna. And uh, yes, Angela, there's a, a lot of what Lord Duncan says there I would be totally agreeing with. And I think what we've seen during, especially during the lockdown, is people taking more risk at home because, as you rightly say, they've got their kit back at home. There's no IT department in the middle to try and defend against attacks. We see people going onto websites that they wouldn't normally go onto at work, and that can compromise their IT as well. But uh, we also see, actually, we see state, states taking opportunities here as well. So if you are a person of badness or a state looking to target someone of interest, actually, if they have links to a property firm, to an estate agency, then that can be a route in the door. And uh, I've seen only recently myself, um, I still have property back in the UK. I got a spurious email from our uh, estate agency in London uh, with a link which just didn't look or feel right to me and by playing around with it it was quite clear that that the link in this email was pointing to a website hosted in iran and this is when i, when I reported this to the estate agent they they really couldn't have cared less frankly because they said well that's an old email address we don't use that anymore which misses the point if you have this infrastructure sitting that you own or that you manage and it's there to be exploited, then there are people who will exploit it, be it a single individual, be it an organized crime group, be it a malicious state actor. And uh, as Lord Blunkett says there, they're looking to get access to your personal data, to your financial data. How can they make use of that either for sale, for profit, which fundamentally most of it is for, or if you're a significant target of interest, maybe you're a politician, maybe you're a diplomat, maybe you're a chief executive of a company, then there can be other reasons behind that. So we come back to the basics. We can do so much to defeat the opposition by just doing the basics of keeping our software and our hardware up to date, of being aware of who we're engaging with and making sure our own infrastructure is as protected as possible. Now, we all know and we all see it's impossible to keep everything secure 100% of the time. Of course it is. But we need to do the basics. And it seems to me, and certainly some of the countries that, that I'm dealing with and my staff are dealing with, that those basics just aren't protected. There is a naivety going into this saying, well, no one would ever look at me. No one would ever seek to exploit me or my company or our clients because we have nothing to hide. And actually, if that's, the, if that's the perspective that you take, you are one of the most vulnerable because you're less likely to understand that that email that you got saying that you've won the lottery or that you need to click on this link to download a document, that that is then giving access to your entire systems taking control of that, potentially giving access to malicious software, to ransomware, which takes your business offline, where you're going to get into a really horrible negotiation with people trying to hold you to ransom. Um, and all of this is really taking a preventive-based approach. So assuming that people will look at you, that they will seek to exploit you and to make money from you. And there are lots of preventive measures which are really simple to put in place. And we're not just talking the basics of antivirus and anti-malware software, because most of the challenges here are human. You can put all the tech stuff in place that you like, but if someone goes to a conference, gets given the free USB stick, they think, well, great, I've got a free USB stick. I'll go back to the office and jam it into my computer. The advice that I give to my staff and our, our colleagues in government around the world is, you go to a conference, you go to a meeting, someone gives you a USB stick, stick it in the microwave and throw it in the bin because you have no idea what that, what's on that, what the intent behind that is, and the vulnerability that that potentially creates to your business. So we have to think that our job, whether you are in the property business, whether you're in government, is to protect information, it's to protect ourselves, it's to protect the integrity of our systems. And that needs a little bit of thought sometimes. And if you get that email at three o'clock in the morning or just before midnight saying, this is really urgent, we need to move this money urgently, Otherwise, we're going to lose a sale, we're going to lose access to a property market. Take a moment and think about it, because that's how business email compromise, how the fraud element engage. It is time pressure. It is financial pressure. And there is nothing that can't wait for a couple of minutes. Pick up the phone, contact that person. Don't reply on email. 
because if that email has already been compromised by the bad guys, you're replying to someone else. You're not replying to the person that it comes from. So take a minute, take a step back, think about it, think about what the impact would be if this goes horribly wrong, put a phone call in, and then reflect upon it. And that takes that element of that element of pressure away from the opposition that they can't then put you in a position to do something because you've got control. You are in control of what goes on. I'll stop there. Thank you, Angela. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, and, and I think that that is the big message is, you know, take take a moment because these cyber criminals absolutely do work on our vulnerabilities. And I think we've seen a lot of cloned websites, all of that stuff coming out about furlough. You need to find out about this now. You know, you need to get this funding now. You know, all of the messaging from government, you need to look at this now. Um, and so people have just sort of click on it it looks so real this is the problem is all of these websites they're so sophisticated and some you know these cyber criminals they haven't been on lockdown they're just sat at their computers you know day in day out looking for those opportunities so i think that's really really sound advice take a moment and, and think and actually go back to picking up the telephone Really good advice. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'd like to go to Joe. I'd like to go to you now. Um, at the TM group, you know, you're very conscious around that digital safety. We've been talking around that. You're dealing with customers, your lawyers, estate agents. What do you feel are the biggest threats to your customers um, and what they face in the cybercrime? Thanks, Angela. And I have to say, before I go on, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Neil um, has said in terms of the process and, and, and time pressure um, is is the killer here. I mean, the number of phishing type emails that I receive on a personal level, both from my personal account and to my email account, I mean, there are numbers of them every single day. Um, and, and I'm actually sort of staggered that, that there isn't more uh, 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 um, than, than there's actually is reported. Uh, well, maybe there's quite a lot that is unreported as a result. Um, but I think the, you know, I mean, the worrying thing for the property market and from the perspective of our clients is just how susceptible uh, it is to, to cyber crime, and I'll come on to that in a second. Um, but also, of course, it's hugely attractive uh, to porters and criminals due to the very large sums of money um, that move about during any single property transaction. Um, so just covering that, that latter point first, um, mortgage lending on property in the UK um, is getting close to £300 billion per year. Um, and that accounts uh, for a significant proportion of the circa £1 million, um, uh, 1 million uh, property transactions that we, that we can see in a, in, in a good year. Um, which means that the, the average single transaction is, is around the 300 a mark. So criminals can afford to fail often and succeed only rarely for this market to be hugely attractive to them. Um, and, and I've seen stats that say the FCA believe that there are, um, uh, I don't know how they get this number, but, 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 they, but they believe there are around about 1,400 uh, organised criminal gangs um, that are targeting uh, the mortgage market at, at the moment. So it's, it's clearly attractive. Um, going back to the, the, the um, susceptibility point, I think it's about the way the market is structured and the way the market operates that makes it susceptible. Um, if, if you go away from the lender space, which is dominated by, you know, the so-called big, um, the market is hugely complex and, 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 and disaggregated um, with a multitude of professionals involved in each transaction and they're, they're often regulated by, by various different bodies. And sitting at the heart of each of those transactions is, is a number of our clients is one of the sort of 4,000 or so practicing law firms, uh, ranging from sort of large volume specialized conveyance and businesses um, and, and, and large commercial practices, local high street sole practitioners. Um, and the biggest challenge comes in managing the communication between those parties, as, as Neil has alluded to. Um, that creates the biggest opportunity. Um, the SRA uh, have stated that over 70% of current cyber crime comes in the form of email interception. So this is where the fraudsters are able to get sight of a of a transaction that's ongoing, that might be through hacking, a lot of the stuff is actually in the public domain, you've got a right move, you know, house is gonna move, you can work out who lives in the house, you can probably start to go at them from there. Um, and then you seek to fool the solicitor into sending funds to a bank account uh, from which the funds are swiftly moved on uh, and lost. And that might sound 
uh, you know, with, with common sense and all the other good things that we've talked about, combat, but the time pressures um, uh, 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 and, and dealing with multiple third parties because you've got, you know, brokers in there, you've got estate agents, you've got buyers, you've got sellers, you've got everybody else, you've got lenders and so on. Um, unfortunately, slips can and, and, and do occur. Um, one sort of high, highly profiled case uh, was of a, of a sort of 70 year old lady who was defrauded of over £600,000 uh, when she was selling her family uh, home in London um, because criminals used an email address that had a single character difference from her real address and, and it uh, instructed Litter to redirect parts of the proceeds of the sale into the criminal's bank account. Um, as we've alluded to, that's not the only way. Identity theft is something we are seeing more and more uh, instances of. Um, and that can actually lead to situations where the criminal is seeking to sell property belonging to the victim um, of, the, of the identity theft. And of course, the property market, because of its size and, and the way that it operates, is, is one of those that's continually targeted by criminals for the purpose of anti-money laundering. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of stuff uh, for, for criminals to go at here. Um, all of these are weaknesses that the industry is aware of. Um, uh, and actually, most of the conversations that we have with our clients is, is, is uh, or a lot of the conversations we have with our clients are, are around them talking about how we can introduce, um, you know, uh, more sophisticated, um, you know, uh, ways of preventing uh, uh, this happening as part of the we deliver. Um, but as Neil and I think David have both said already, uh, you know, technology in itself cannot solve this. Um, it just needs common sense and it needs the right amount of time and focus at the real point. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And it's interesting. What are your thoughts on um, blockchain? You know, this was very sort of trendy, very sort of, you know, the big word, supposed to be a really new secure way of, of putting all the documents and locking that down. Have you seen much around that? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Is that going to be a useful tool to use? <laughs> I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of words on it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that, I do think there's value in in, in blockchain. Um, it is a it is a, a relatively new technology. Um, it, fr from my perspective, um, and, and, and there are examples. I think the Swedish Land Registry now uses blockchain. I think the Republic of Georgia's um, uh, Neil would probably be more more um, uh, knowledgeable on those um, places than I would be. Um, but um, so so they are. It is starting to be used, and there are. Uh, companies in this country that are talking about it. Um, mm. But my, my view is um, actually the technology exists today to make this much more secure. Um, it's not, we, we don't necessarily need blockchain. Blockchain might be the next step down the path and it might be the sort of thing that, that, that we're looking at in a big way in five years' time. But there's still quite a lot of unanswered questions with blockchain um, and a lack of expertise in this country. So I think it's a EBT. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, Nick, I'd like to come to you next. So as a provider of cyber intelligence to global institutions, have you seen any shifts in your customers' behaviours towards cyber attacks and fraud? Yeah, thanks, Angela. Um, well, absolutely. I think with the, uh, the crisis that started in kind of like late February with everybody being at home and essentially on extended business continuity planning um, it's really focused the minds of organizations and, and hopefully employees as well around what their cyber exposure and risks might actually be um, 18 months ago we were going through GDPR and I think um, we were seeing a lot of investment in the physical infrastructure um, making sure that the networks were hardened uh, introducing information security policies um, and all of that good stuff. But at the end of the day, it's the human element to go back to uh, what David and, and uh, Joe were, were mentioning earlier. Um, you know, you're only as good as your weakest link. So things like, you know, introducing a lot of training into programs around, you know, the uh, email compromise scenarios. Um, and it's, it's, it's happened to us internally as well. You do get an awful lot of emails coming through and, and you're under pressure and, and you will click on a link. Um, so it's keeping that, you know, really in the forefront of everybody's minds about what the vulnerabilities are, particularly when you're working from home. And we've touched on the fact that there are a lot of scams going on and the fact that, um, you know, these criminals can operate anywhere in the world and, and they don't sleep. They're very, very busy because this is a very, very lucrative market. I think the, the shift that we're trying to, that we're seeing at the moment is um, 
the move away from just simply having a hardened network and the uh, the infrastructure in place. Um, it's you know we we provide data where we're we're, we're collecting information and data from criminal organisations uh, and gangs on the on the dark web and they're trading identity information. They're trading information on on businesses. They you know they they collaborate with one another and they go after particular companies and, and individuals. And we see a vast amount of data on thousands of different forums, chat rooms, websites that is openly being being traded. And it's not something the public can necessarily get into you have to be part of kind of like the the network and be invited into these these criminal organizations because they do they shut down websites they spin them up in other 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 places and they move around for obvious reasons you know they're trying to uh, prevent themselves being caught by the authorities um, and being part of that trust trusted network if you like we, we do see a lot of this data so the shift that we're seeing um, and I think the UK is somewhat uh, you know probably about 18 months to two years behind other markets, particularly the US. So the US has always, uh, well, for, for some time really, um, not just looked at its physical infrastructure, but also what data is out there on individuals, employees and companies already being traded on the dark web. Once you have that baseline and knowing what information is already available on you or your organization, significantly helps you to better thwart any incoming um, fraudulent type Type, typologies such as the business email compromise or indeed you know targeting specific um, senior people who can move money around in, in the business you know maybe they've used similar passwords on you know their social media or their personal emails and that's a that's a big problem so knowing what is out there um, also other data points such as your your date of birth your mother's maiden name secret questions and answers where you went to school you know all of that good stuff the criminals generally have a lot of this information already because if you've given it out on, on the web to date, it's going to be there in, perpetu in perpetuity. You know, it's not something that can easily be, be taken away. So the education side of things, as well as trying to get companies to say, well, look, let's take a baseline view of what is out there. Once we know that, we can take the measures around that to safeguard ourselves. Um, and that's, you know, you mentioned, Angela, the, the BBC article, which was very, which was really very, very timely. You know, and that poor lady obviously went through, it's not just the financial hook that she's on, it's also the emotion that goes through, you know, goes with that as well. Um, and in you know, the cases that we see, it can take anywhere between six and nine months to, to repair your credit um, and all that goes with it. It's, it's, a, it's very, very, you know, it's a very, very horrible experience to, to have to go through. So, you know, part of this as well is, well, you know, once you know what data is out there, be very, very careful about what you're actually um, giving away as well. Do these companies need to know your mother's maiden name? Do they really need to know your date of birth? Um, I would question that and I'd be very, very careful as well uh, to what David said about, you know, don't leave your house open. In the same way, don't go and visit websites that you're not familiar with. Um, if it seems too good to be true, um, it, it probably is. Um, and I think also, you know, the other aspect as well of, of once your data is out there that you need to be aware of, the, the Disney hack that was purported back in October last year when they launched their, uh, their streaming uh, TV uh, services. Initially, it looked like um, people had been, or, or Disney had been hacked and people's accounts had been taken over. And, and what had actually happened was, they subsequently found out, was that criminals were simply taking data that had been out on the web for years and years and years, and simply running it through a program that looked for valid combinations of email and passwords. And people don't seem to change their credentials very often. And they were getting, you know, once you get a hit, they can run millions of these, these attacks, you know, in a very short period of time. Once they got a valid uh, combination, they were into the account, they could then change the password, they could then take over that account. Um, and you have to be careful, that's just what, I mean, that's a fairly benign, it's irritating, but they can go into other, you know, e-commerce type sites and take more data from those sites that builds up a bigger picture where the real prize is things like taking out loans in your name. In the property market, obviously, you know, trying to, trying to ensure that funds are diverted to other accounts as well. And when you look at the, you know, the value of these transactions, you know, really, people really need to be very, very careful. So I think, I think we all have a duty of care around from a business perspective in terms of what we're doing as a business and making sure that our data and our customers' data isn't out there, but also our employee data as well and making sure that you know, their, their information is protected to a certain degree or at least an, enable them to have a, a balanced view of potentially what might be out there that can compromise them. 
And, and what what can we do? I mean, you referred back to Gemma, 30 year old Gemma that had her identity stolen. She had no idea. She had absolutely no idea that all of this was going on, accounts being opened in her name, etc. until she tried to get that mortgage and it was refused. So is there anything that we can do? You know, we've talked around, um, you know, the data that's out there and, and all of us, you know, if we were to put a line in the sand today and say, OK, I can't do anything about what happened yesterday, but how can I change my behaviours going forward? Is there any way that we can check if we have been compromised, if we could, we, is there something we can do to, to see? I mean, for all I know, part of us in the audience now could have had our identity taken. We have no idea. So when we get off this call, is there something that we could go and do, you know, some solid steps like change your passwords? But is there somewhere we can check? Yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, you know, number of the, I would start really with the credit reference uh, agencies and credit, you know, look at, look at what your credit file looks like at the moment. And a number of them offer a, a typical sort of service that we do as well. They will do a dark web scan of looking for your data that may be out there and provide that back to you. And then once you've got that, that information, you know, make sure you change your passwords, make sure you contact your financial institutions as well. And if you do think you've got a threat, you know, make them aware of the fact that your data is potentially compromised. Ask for their support and help in that. Um, we obviously provide services to, you know, to Clear School, but there are other, you know, ma major uh, global um, credit reference agencies that provide similar types of services as well. Uh, Perhaps we can maybe share some of those uh, with with people today, you know, useful links, um, you know, one hopes is after today, if we share some links, that at least everybody watching is going to know that they're good ones, um, and that they can follow up, because and, there's uh, our uh, personal data. Uh, the, but national, other people, the, national, the, the National Cyber Security Centre has very good website and people can get a feel from that as to what they need to do including cyber essentials plus which i think companies should all look to be doing it's a it's a very baseline doesn't take you very far but at least it's a starting point yeah no thank you thank you i think what we'll do today is we will um you know make a list of, of some useful contacts references and places that people can go just to check that out because there's one checking your personal um, identity but then companies as may as well may want to see um you know if they've got some vulnerabilities so um i'd like to now move over to nicola um so nicola obviously titania is at the forefront of designing software that beats the criminals. Um, and we've talked around that technology point of view. But in your opinion, you know, we've touched on this now around are we doing enough in the human side of things, the human element, you know, what should we doing and, and what could we do and can we do to change behaviors? So here's the thing, we often talk in security terms like it's some kind of weather house you know the sunshine guy comes out the, the rainy person goes in and security isn't like that it's both um, technical and people together is the strongest thing so people aren't the weakest link technology isn't the weakest link we can both be the weakest link um, so so a company that just focuses on technical and doesn't train their people is going to be more vulnerable than somebody that, that does both and vice versa and some of the challenges are um, a lot of the voices in our field are either people that have technical stuff to sell or people who are tr selling training. And the, sometimes the, the voices are therefore not as balanced as they could be usefully for people. So just using some of the things that have come up, Neil made a really good point about USB sticks. And it was a very technically worded point and, and unsurprisingly, because Neil's a really technical guy and can also talk to people too. I kind of think of USB sticks as other people's underwear. If somebody gave you some random underwear in the street, you would not be putting it on. And so that, you know, you couldn't really be putting USB sticks in your computer. And, and when people start thinking of it like that, then um, it makes it a little bit more icky. Um, but in terms of USB sticks in Cyber Essentials, which David just mentioned, um, Cyber Essentials has the facility, it mentions turning off auto run, which would be the technical control that would go along with, with that. So both together, training your people, 
Um, and by the way, the posters on other people's underwear are available and it's quite a good little poster for USB things, um, is, is useful. And turning off auto run and doing the technical controls is useful. Um, and in terms of cyber essentials, the, the plus is really, really good, but anybody that hasn't got a lot of funds, so um, maybe estate agents or people that are a smaller groups, you can actually download those controls for free and still do them, even if you then don't go and do the certification. So you can still go and do useful things. Um, phishing has been mentioned. Um, so in terms of technical things, you'd have access control processes. Um, you'd have the checking things you'd maybe put in. Um, things that would limit access, so like two-factor authentication and um, having the, those logins that maybe go to your phone as well, using a password manager so you can have, like I've got over a hundred passwords in my password manager, which means that I can have a lot more complex passwords. And I only have to have one and that password manager also uses two-factor authentication, so it needs two things. Um, but the emotional ma messaging goes with that, with training, um, so I've, uh, my, my uh, Twitter handle is CyberGoGiver, um, and I've just literally put a link on there for people. Uh, they're Dr. Jessica Barker, who deals a lot with the human side of cybersecurity, and a group of other people did some really great awareness training. Um, you can go there, get that for free, pass it out to your people. Essentially what it is in, in short form is, if the message is emotional, it's designed to get and designed to get you to take action, um, then taking a moment to think, as Neil said, is, is the, the, the key there. And um, they give you actual examples. So again, it's free. Um, one of the other things, again, with money. So that was mentioned. And, and the reason I'm talking about this really practically is I don't think anybody would disagree with training people. But often we talk about stuff like this in these calls and it's like, well, how, what does that mean? What do we train them on? Where are the things that I can do that will make the most impact on my um, security and reduce my risk the most. So anything that could lead to access, um, with, including logins, so any emails, messages, websites that say login here, those are the ones that to be more careful with and anything that leads as a route to money. And access for criminals is a route to money because that's how they can then stick things like ransomware onto your sites. Um, so anything with emails with payment documents in, and again, it's really simple to say, pick up the phone. It's, it's, it's about processes and technical and people. And in terms of the human element, um, I, I, I think it might've been Joe that um, said that you're only as good as your weakest link. So that's why, you know, it's technology and people together. That means that you then have a strong chain. Um, in terms of where you can go to, um, yeah, Nick mentioned that, you know, the, the kind of data bureaus and things like that and the service he does is a really good one. Um, a real instant one that's totally free, there's a guy called Troy Hunt who runs a website called Have I Been Owned? Um, <laughs> It's owned as in the way that um, myself as a nerd would spell it. So it's P-W-N-E-D. <laughs> um, but the, the website is Have I Been Owned, spelled P-W-N-E-D. Um, so, so essentially there you can put your own email in and it will say whether it's been in one of the breaches. And he's probably the biggest source of breach information on the planet currently in, it, that's accessible easily for free by people. So... You know, there's a whole heap of stuff that I've just dumped in there and I'm really happy to share those links so that anybody reviewing this afterwards can, can go to those. But in terms of um, people, yes, 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 people should have training. But the reality is that even with training, we are still likely to make errors because we have human operating systems that have biases and things that enable people to manipulate us. And, you know, it doesn't matter how good our training is. Like it was said earlier, we only have to fail once for then the technical controls to have to try and help us. <laughs> and, um, and actually, if you look at where most breaches occur, um, it's a combination of people and poor cyber hygiene. So it's actually the basics 
that um, David mentioned could be easy, but we seem to fail on over and over and over again. Um, and that's where Titania sort of lives and works yeah. and making sure the basics are consistently applied because that's the, the, the trick in that, it's consistency across the board. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And I think, um, I think all of us as well have to start taking more responsibility ourselves um, and, you know, and, and we've, we've said this several times, you know, we know if you leave your handbag in the front of the car and the car door open, it's not going to be there when you come back. You know, we know that, um, you know, you wouldn't leave your child in the car, you know, with the door open and go to the supermarket or your front door open, as David said. And I think it's, it is about taking the responsibilities ourselves um, because, you know, there's so many things now out there and they were talking around quizzes. You know, you think that you could be entering a quiz online because it's fun and you're in lockdown and it's a bit amusing, but actually what information are you giving um, that you're handing out to other people? Um, we've had, uh, we've had uh, a question in um, that um, um, open this up to the panel. And the question was, um, what can companies offering services to consumers do to tighten that data security? Sometimes consumers have no choice about giving the amount of details they have to. And we do find that. We are asked lots and lots of questions. And there is that moment inside and you think, oh, I don't feel comfortable maybe, but actually I need to give you this to get what I want, whether it's open a credit card or whatever it is. So, so that's a question. So, so who, who would like to come back on that? What can what uh, what companies offering services to consumers to tighten up the data security? So can I and your technology? So so here's the challenge: as a company, you want to ask certain amounts of information because you need to be able to validate is this person who's phoning you to use the service that they've paid for the person that paid for it. Um, you as a person, as a consumer, you have little to no control over what information you give to companies. You can complain and say this is, you know, against GDPR and you can say stuff like that, but, you know, and I've done it as I'm sure a lot of other people have. Um, but the reality is you have very little control over a company's processes. What you can do though is make a note of what's been asked. Like if you've got a password manager, there's normally a notes field. So you can say, this is the information that company has on me. So that if somebody is calling from that company, and I'd suggest that you put the phone down and call them back, by the way, you can check, is this a question that they've even asked? Because, you know, if you've got, so you, you manage yourself and, and your data, because that's in your power. Um, if you're a company, then, you know, following GDPR practices and things like that is a useful starting point, but that only applies to companies in certain countries and now we're global, so. It, it, it is a, a hard thing to do, but essentially you have a duty of care as a company to look after people's data. I think that's a really good point, you know, that, that, that sort of check and balance on, you know, is that a question? Actually, I'll come back to you. Um, you know, because again, we, we've talked around um, them taking advantage of our vulnerabilities and when we feel weak or, you know, when we have that, we talked about the Friday frenzy in buying and selling properties, you know, that Friday afternoon when you want to complete because you want the keys to your house, you know, you sometimes maybe don't take that extra moment to think, as Neil referred to, just take a moment to think actually does that feel right you know it, is that right and should they be asking that um what well, thank you nicola what i'd like to do uh, now is i'd like to um, open up the panel for a, a bigger discussion uh, so please do feel that that you can sort of chip in just just pop your hand up um and i think really is is what does the panel think and see you know we talked about the buying and the selling of property you know you, how do you think that that will be made safer you know, what, what advice can you give the audience today around making that whole process safer? So who'd like I, to come? I, can, I can give you a view on that, I guess, Angela, from my own perspective. And I think that comes back to you know, where does the majority of the you know, fraud and criminal activity in this market uh, happen at the moment? What's the weak link? And that is that email interception uh, point. So... 
you know, a lot of the, I mean, a, a lot of the work that, um, uh, that we talk to people about is actually how can we make those communication channels more secure? How can we move away from uh, email? How can we, you know, move into more authenticated ways of sharing data with people where effectively we've got more uh, knowledge um, and more reassurance um, that the person that we think we're communicating with is the person that we're actually communicating with. Um, so whether that's, um, you know, sort of, a, we, we, we've got different products, I guess, and I don't want to, but, but you know, we've got products effectively that we can, uh, we can use with our clients to help them uh, migrate away from the need uh, for email. Um, but then there's also other organizations out there that, 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 that provide some, some pretty, smart technology um you know with, with the advent of open banking for example you know th th there's more uh, intelligent things that firms are able to do um in terms of checking bank uh, details that, that they sort of send it to so so um you know we we work with organizations like word checker for example um you know and they, they have software solutions out there which effectively uh, allow you to sort of uh, check that the bank account you're being asked to use is one that is used in, you know, if you're dealing with another competitor, is used in conveyancing transactions or, um, or, or they actually have products as well, which allow you to double check some consumer bank as well, because of the open banking fee. So there are, there are providers out there, um, but it, and it goes back to the point that we've made again and again and again, it looks like a fish and it smells like a fish, it probably is a fish. And, um... Yes, David. Yeah, Angela, I mean, I agree with all of that. It was um, the lack of encryption of our emails from uh, uh, the Home Office to our embassy in Paris that led to the demise that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so I, I've got something very old fashioned to say. I think that we, we should try and even in this great digitalized world to go back to personal contact. In the old days, if you went into an estate agent for either commercial or domestic properties, you'd have a contact person. You'd have someone you were dealing with I, I think we should just go back to trying to get the human touch. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive in terms of productivity, but it's magnificent in terms of getting a service. I would agree. And it's funny that you just brought that up now because I just made a note to myself, you know, pick up the phone. Um, because I think that that's the only way that, that, you know, we've so much in society gone away from that. And you're talking to automated systems and you're just filling in forms and i think you're right you know just just picking up that phone and actually speaking to somebody is it, it feels a lot more secure when you do that um neil can i just come to you uh on, on the next question and just to ask you know what do you believe uh is is the next thing for cyber criminals and fraudsters you know the next trends um, you know, is there anything that you're seeing out there that we can, you can give us some insights into to sort of start trying to watch out for those? Sure, thanks Angela. I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking about my underwear choices in the past, thanks to Rico, so I'm sure <laughs> that, I think. Um, what we've seen, something that uh, really caught me was we did some sort of threat analysis and threat assessment whenever lockdown happened. In Vienna, we locked down a, a few weeks before the, those of you back in the UK, and we started looking around at criminality change and how crime was seeking to evolve. And I'll stick, actually I'll stick the links up to our uh, threat assessments in the chat after I've spoken. But we saw on the, this might be something that Nick saw as well, but on dark web markets, so the encrypted hidden part of the internet that you need to download another browser to get access to, we saw criminals who had never acted online before going on to criminal marketplaces and asking questions of other criminals. How do I make money from this? Where can I make money, profit, influence rapidly during lockdown, um, during, during quarantine? Because if we look at how lots of, lots of crime is obviously motivated by, by profit, I would say the majority of it is, but for some criminals, moving that profit became much harder. Some can use cryptocurrencies and they're looking to exploit cryptocurrency capabilities. Uh, there's a real lack of legislation and policy around that around the world. So, for example, um, when I was in law enforcement, uh, it was really pretty easy to see somebody going through Heathrow, Gatwick, any airport around the world carrying big bags of cash or coins because it was quite easy to detect. If I walk through an airport now with an iPhone and $400 million worth of cryptocurrency on it, the most border agents, irrespective of which country they're in, wouldn't have a clue. And they might even have legislation to counter that. 
And that comes back to as well for your due diligence within the property market. If someone is seeking to pay you and where that money is coming from, do you accept things like cryptocurrencies? How do you perform your own customer due diligence and know your customer functions around that? Because we see that changing in different parts of the world where that's becoming the norm now. And I raise sometimes a skeptical eyebrow on this and whatever there's a, a part of the Secretary General's office that deals with new technologies and some people on those calls are really enthusiastic about how cryptocurrencies give access to finance to people who don't have banks. Um, and my view is always looking at well, how the bad guys and bad girls seek to exploit this. So I think if really for all of you who work in property and the exchange of detail, and personal detail and money, it's looking at, well, sometimes you've got to think a bit like a criminal, okay? And you've got to take a step back and think, if I was going to target our own business, what would I do? Where are we most vulnerable? And we look at that business email compromise scenario. Who has access to those logon details? Do you have social media feeds that lots of people in the business have access to the logon details and the account? Where can that be compromised? And it's, it's putting those basics in place. And I agree also with David very much that we need personal, we need personal uh, contact in this. I've spent the morning running around cafes in Vienna meeting with diplomats from around the world because we're not able to do it in the building, which is still locked down. And you can do some stuff online, but you need to be able to look into someone's eyes and their body language to see where things are going and sit down and have that conversation. And I, I really think there is, when I look at sometimes how banks operate, that there is so much that you can do through a secure encrypted chat. But sometimes it then says, no, now you have to call us. Or you get a call from the fraud service like, aha, you've been, your, your account has been compromised. Please, can you tell us your mother's maiden name? And the answer to that has to be, bugger off. No, I'll call you back because that's how to do it, right? It's all about putting that time pressure on and making the best use of what we've got. Um, thank you, Neil. And I'm mindful now, we've only got five minutes left and um, I wanted to just um, come to each of you and just asking you for one nugget and gem, just one thing that the audience could take away and action and do something really, really practical. So David, could I just start with you and what would that, that be? Angela. Yeah. Before yeah. we do that, sorry to interrupt you, but can I just answer one question because somebody's asked a question in the chat um, yes. about uh, one of the links that I recommended. Okay. Um, so, so the question, um, oh, the question I can't even scroll to. <laughs> um, the question was uh, about the platform, have I been owned um, and saying, would criminals be able to use it? Um, the reality is that anything that is disclosable could be used by anybody. But that would be like saying Microsoft shouldn't announce the fact that here are the vulnerabilities because criminals are about to go and use them because once it's public, people could use stuff. I know that Troy Hunt does a lot of stuff as much as he possibly can to make sure that his information isn't usable in that way, which is why when you go on, you're searching for your email um, and it's not disclosing a whole um, set of data. Um, so the answer is that there's always risk when you make stuff accessible to people, but the reality is that this is a really good service for people to be able to check their own risk. Thank you, thank you, Nicola. Um, David, what would your uh, parting comment be or one nugget and gem? Uh, to uh, very quickly, be? if you're a company, take advice. If you're an individual, don't answer cold calls. And just recall what happened to me and the author, Frederick Forsyth. The BBC managed to get to both our identities to get us a driving license. In his case, he didn't want to drive. In my case, it was very unwise that I did. So um, be very careful with your identity. And that's really been the whole theme of the last hour. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Nick, what would your parting comment be? Yeah, simply take ownership of your own data. You know, be very careful on what you share out there. Go and use these free services. You know, ClearScore also do a free service too, as do others. Go and find out what is available on you at this at this current moment. And uh, uh, and yeah, just be very very aware that criminals are targeting Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Joe, um, what would your your nuggets and gems? Um, I, well, sorry, I, I would um, uh, probably reiterate what I said already, which is avoid the kind of pressurized situation. If somebody is trying to pressure you to do something, take the time to think about why they are trying to pressurize you. And if you need to take a little bit more time to double check something, 
I would strongly recommend you do that. Um, and I would, and I would, uh, I would say if you take that approach, and if you uh, make sure that, as others have said, that rather than rely on emails, uh, if you've got an email and you need to pick up the phone, yeah. otherwise try and move away from emails. Yeah. Yeah. So a check and balance, take time, stop and think, pick up the phone, um, some really sound advice. Um, we, we've come to the end of our time and I'm just going to hand back to Paul just to wrap up. I personally would like to say to all of you, thank you so much for giving us your time today. Absolutely fabulous panel. We will share with the audience some more information. Um, thank you so much for me, Angela Edwards, and thank you very much. Uh, to David Blunkett, Nick Parfit, Nicola Whiting MBE, Neil Walsh, and back over to you, Paul. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, Angela, uh, and the panel. Uh, um, very interesting uh, and lively debate there. Uh, and thanks to our audience as well for joining us on our biggest programme so far in this series. Um, I, I took three takeaways from today, and I think firstly, uh, David provided some good advice in, in treat cybercrime like the risk of physical crime. Um, uh, and, and that was broadly uh, agreed with across the panel. I, I think generally people take more risk at home with their IT uh, and with the overall threat of cyber crimes heightened at the moment with the requirement to actually work remotely and the home working that we're all doing. I, th I think closer to home and um, from a TM perspective, the property transaction is the single biggest transaction a person will make in their life. Um, it will get targeted by criminals and it takes both technology, good practice, and human common sense and training to minimise it. Um, I think, I think um, and, and more weirdly, I think, um, as Neil and Nicholas said, you know, don't accept free USB sticks unless you're going to put them in the microwave. And um, certainly don't try to put them on like underwear. Well, I'm going to remember that one. Um, so, so that's it from us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today on TMTV. Um, if you like what you saw, then please follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, the latest schedule of events is published there and also these sessions are recorded so you can replay anything from the previous programs. Thank you once more and goodbye.